I'm going to be talking today about a project that the STEP Center ran in its uh, first phase over the last three or so years called Innovation, Sustainability, Development, A New Manifesto. The first question is really, why is a research center like STEPS writing a manifesto? It's not normally what researchers do. Um, and in order to provide some historical context and to answer that question, um, I just want to tell you, if you didn't, if you'd not heard of it before, of a document that was produced by colleagues from the same institutions back in 1970, which ended up being called the Sussex Manifesto. This was commissioned by the UN as the introductory chapter to the World Plan of Action on Science and Technology for Development in the Second Development Decade, that is the 1970s. Uh, it was written by the Sussex Group, led by Hans Singer, also involving Jeff Oldham, Charles Cooper, R.C. Desai, Chris Freeman, Oscar Gish, and Stephen Hill. And what our colleagues did was they wrote an introductory chapter, presented it to the UN, and put forward not only an analysis, which argued that science and technology efforts were severely biased towards the problems of the so-called advanced countries, but also put forward some challenging targets around investment, around technology transfer, capacity building, and specifically around reconfiguring uh, organizations in both developed and developing countries so that indigenous science and technology capabilities could be grown in the developing countries and actually targeted to the problems that they faced. The chapter was completely rejected by the UN. Uh, it was seen as not the role of scientists or of researchers to set such targets, and so in discussions at the UN, it earned this title of the Sussex Manifesto. So 40 years later, we're living in a world where poverty still exists, many of the same problems and biases still exist, and we're also confronted by new challenges, especially those related to environmental sustainability. And it's for this reason that the STEP Center embarked on this project to develop a new manifesto. However, rather than just working on our own, in Brighton, very small uh, town in a small country just off the coast of Western Europe, we thought we would try and uh, involve a wider constituency, and we were very lucky to work with a number of partners from around the world. <coughs> the project itself not only advocates um, more participatory and democratic governance of science and technology, but also tried to provide fora in which discussions around science and technology could occur. And so we used a number of techniques to do that. Firstly, looking back through history and the ideas from around the world that have fed into the, the area in which we all work, we created a wiki timeline on our website and invited colleagues to submit their suggestions for the most poignant and game-changing uh, documents or meetings that had influenced the way we think about these questions. We also ran a series of seminars, commissioned 13 background papers from Step Center members, and created, following the Step Center Symposium in 2009, a draft manifesto, which we then circulated to colleagues around the world. And to a varying extent, these, uh, this uh, draft was discussed at a series of 20 round tables held in these um, particular places. The role of the round tables and the role of the project itself is not to assert one particular answer. Although we're putting forward our own political position, we're trying to provide a platform, as I said, for alternative viewpoints and for the wide diversity of ideas that are out there. And this goes beyond institutions and countries to individuals. So we also invited people to give their own messages to the UN or other global bodies around innovation in these vox pops, which you can watch on our website. But at the end of all of this, we also felt it was important for us to come up with a message uh, which belonged to the Step Center. And as a result of that, we pulled together this new manifesto. And there are copies um, distributed around which you can take home. In addition, in order to highlight these different perspectives, we created something which is called a multimedia manifesto, which is on the CD-ROMs on some of your chairs. 
And this not only includes the same text as the new manifesto from the SEP Centre, but also links out to other resources, either on the CD or on the web, which illustrate points, ideas and examples, many of which are in agreement with what we propose, but many of which are also putting forward alternative views. The idea here is to bring the discussion alive and to keep it going um, through to the future. But turning to this new manifesto, which as I said, it's not a representative synthesis of all of the ideas that we came across, it's very much a view from the step center. We put forward a vision and uh, following from that, a new agenda. The vision is that science, technology and innovation work far more directly for the objectives of social justice, poverty alleviation and environmental sustainability. And we argue that this requires a new politics, a new democratic politics, uh, not only locally and nationally, but most importantly, at the global level. We argue that this kind of politics needs to change to focus on a new agenda, one which we call a 3D agenda, because it focuses on the three Ds. The first of which involves a move away from a focus on the scale or pace of innovation and technological change towards its direction. What kinds of technologies are emerging? What characteristics of those technologies? Uh, for example, those which Anand has um, highlighted around uh, climate, uh, climate friendly technologies, low carbon intensity technologies, also low polluting technologies or more material efficient technologies in the environmental sense, but also what is the direction of technology and who is it benefiting? And this takes us to the second D, the D of distribution. We believe that it's important for innovation politics to focus on more equitable distribution of not only the benefits of technologies, but also the associated risks uh, and costs. And taking both of these two Ds seriously, we believe that it is impossible to, as a result, advocate singular technological um, trajectories or innovation uh, approaches. And therefore, we argue that the third D, one which is possibly newer than the other two, is a focus on diversity and the benefit, the intrinsic benefit of a diversity of innovation approaches, of technological trajectories, especially in the more interconnected and dynamic world where we're faced with increasing environmental, political and economic uncertainties. So diversity, we feel, helps to mitigate lock-in, uh, technological lock-in, to unsustainable trajectories or pathways. We feel that it helps us to build robust and resilient socio-technical systems and cater for not only the increased uncertainty and ignorance which we face in the more dynamic world, but also enables us to cater for different values around sustainability and development. Unitary technological approaches are unable to do that, and diversity is one tool that we have in trying to respond to these seemingly irreconcilable perspectives. There is obviously a trade-off between diversity and in some cases efficiency, and we recognize that, but we still believe that diversity is neglected comparatively in current debates around science, technology, and innovation. So from this 3D agenda emerges a number of different ideas, and just to run through them very quickly, we put forward five areas for action. These are not necessarily offered as a blueprint for uh, policy making, in different countries, we recognize that different countries and the international level Thank you. require different approaches. And so these are thrown out as ideas from which people can draw and adapt. The first of the areas for action is in agenda setting. We believe this needs to be opened up to more participatory processes at national and international levels. Secondly, funding. We believe that there's a role in involving wider stakeholders in the setting of agendas and also allocating funds to science and technology policies and investments. Thirdly, we believe that capacity building should focus not necessarily just on building elite centers of excellence, but also on recognizing professionalism in 
translating research from the lab to the field and understanding not only the technical aspects but also the realities in which innovations can be used. Organizing involves open source networks and a range of different uh, organizational forms which are beginning to emerge which again work across networks rather than involving just research. And then finally we believe that there is room for enhanced reporting, monitoring, evaluation and accountability at national and international levels and in the public and the private sector. So where do we go from this? This is my final slide. Uh, we are continuing to work through the second phase of the STEP Centre, uh, following on from the manifesto and really focusing on impact and engagement in our, in our work. Uh, we're working with a number of partners who draw from a common inspiration and put forward diverse contributions to the debate. And in fact, there were two manifestos, one which emerged from Africa, from the African Technology Policy Studies Network on uh, science, technology, and innovation in Africa, and another that emerged from a network in India called the Knowledge and Civil Society Network, which we're also continuing to share ideas with. And some of the ideas may crop up in later discussions. We're also highlighting concrete lessons learned and examples from different regions around the world. So one example of that work is uh, a paper that's recently been completed by my colleague Elisa Arond, who's going to stand up so that you can see her, and a number of colleagues from Latin America. Um, if people are interested in receiving a copy of that paper, we've brought, brought it with us. So we're discussing different perspectives across the world and um, feeding them into policy debates and foremost among those is really the Rio plus 20 meeting next year um, in Brazil and I've been surprised not to hear more about that at this Globalix conference with the themes of a transition to a green economy and an institutional framework to promote a green economy in the context of sustainable development and poverty alleviation innovation policy is at the core of that agenda and so I think that there's room for networks like Globalix to continue that discussion. Okay, thank you.